everyone, welcome to another ShareWise webinar. Today, I am fortunate enough to be joined by Tom Waterhouse, the Chief Investment Officer at Waterhouse VC. Thank you so much, Tom, for joining me today. Thanks, Kaylin. Uh, great to be on. Um, and for all those that are joining us in the live webinar today, feel free to pop your questions in for Tom. Um, but let's get started. So, Tom, can you give us an overview of what Waterhouse VC is? Yeah, uh, of course. Um, look, so my great grandfather um, was a bookmaker in the nine, sorry, the eighteen hundreds. Um, grandfather was a bookie. My dad was a bookie, uh, and and I straight out of university, I, I became a a bookmaker, which is basically taking bets at the horse races. And it was a great um, business. But then what happened in 2008, they changed the advertising restrictions and allowed uh, internet betting providers to advertise across state lines. And suddenly what was a good business on course bookmaking faced a lot of competition. So we launched an online betting business called TomWaterhouse.com. It was the fastest online growing betting business in Australia. We went from 100 customers to a quarter of a million in 18 months but didn't have the scale of these overseas entrants like uh, Ladbrokes, Paddy Power, William Hill, Bet365 and so on. So in 2013, we sold that business to William Hill, which did a $700 million roll-up in Australia. Uh, we were a small add-on as part of that roll-up. Uh, they bought the Sporting Bet, Centre Bet and, and our business. Um, and then six months into that, the, they asked me to be the CEO of that Australian business. So I ran William Hill Australia for four years we had two and a half billion turnover, had over 500 people working in, in the business teams in Tel Aviv, Manila, uh, and Australia. Ran that for four years. Sold, that was sold as part of the PokerStars um, uh, Flutter um, merger in, uh, in Australia in 2018. I had a two-year non-compete and thought, well, what am I going to do? I've been a bookmaker for the last sort of 20 years. Uh, where's the angle? Where's the edge to, to try and, and make a new business? And thought that the interesting part of the gambling or wagering space was on the supplier side. It was seemed to me relatively easy for an analyst at one of the banks to analyze the value of a Cab Corp or a Ladbrokes or a Flutter because it's the same lines of the PL. You have uh, turnover, gross win, uh, cost of sales, marketing costs, tech costs, headcount costs in your PL. And you can basically evaluate whether the company should be trading it eight times, 10 times, 12 times, and so on. But a supplier to a sports bet or a Tab Corp or a Ladbrokes or a Caesars or MGM, that supplier is much harder to value because they have uh, maybe one, two contracts. Is that co Are those contracts sticky? Are they able to scale and go from two or three operators to 20 operators? Can they go from one geography to multiple um, different countries? And so got a handful of the best um, developers that I'd worked with and, and said, look, let's go and analyze all the tech uh, around the world in the gambling space. And so that started Waterhouse VC coming on five years ago. And basically, we've built the, the fund into three arms. We, we focus one on finding suppliers and option deals. And then there's two other pillars to it. But I, I don't know, Caitlin, do you want me to keep describing that or, or, or should I break there? Yeah, no, please go into the pillars, the other two pillars. Right? Yes. So the first pillar is that we find uh, suppliers generally that have got one, maybe two contracts um, that are revenue generating. And those suppliers might be, they might supply the fixed odds pricing for the bookmakers. They might supply vision. They might build mobile apps. They might be the platforms that the betting sites are built on, uh, esports data supplies, voice betting solutions. Uh, anything that supplies to these gambling companies and we look at them, have they got one contract at least? Are they generating revenue? Then we analyze their tech and we basically think, well, can they grow significantly? And if we think we, they can, we generally invest in them. And we also um, buy options in the business because if we get it right, we think that the business can be worth significantly more than it is today. And then the option unlocks uh, that large upside value. Uh, I'll go back into detail on that pillar one and how we look and analyze the tech because I think it might be interesting a bit later on, but I'll then I'll go into pillar two of our fund now is that we traditionally, we make small investments. So we sit in a lot of cash uh, until we convert the options. So the second pillar of our strategy is that we, um, what we do with the cash, well, we were sitting beginning, at the beginning of the fund, we were sitting in term deposits and, and holding the cash, waiting for the options to come off. 
But we actually adopted the family's been for the last 10 plus years uh, following a, an, a strategy investing in uh, the best performing funds in the world going off their 13F analysis. So any fund with over $100 million in US equities has to release their 13F every quarter. And what we do is we go and look at the best performing funds over the last 30 years that are long only. We then analyze what's in their 13F positions. And then we use uh, three filters, trading under 20 times PE, growing revenue of greater than 20% over the last five years, and basically no debt. And we then evenly weight across those positions, normally sub 20 positions, evenly weighted against them. And then we back test that performance against the S&P 500. Uh, really, we're just trying to hold money to beat uh, the S&P and obviously beat... I think your internet might have cut out there, Tom. Sorry, Tom, you just cut out there. Sorry, yeah, so we have a lower growth. Um, we have a lower multi, uh, P multiple in the S&P 500. We have a higher growth uh, percentage in the S&P 500 and we've outperformed significantly the S&P 500 since we started. So that's our second pillar of where we hold the cash. And then the third pillar of our, our strategy is that we see that the significant area of uh, people making money in the industry is that in the professional betting syndicates. So there's it's very hard to win betting because what uh, is against you is you've got percentage against you in every market that you bet in. So if you specifically focus on horse racing or on sports, the bookies don't know what the true odds of, let's say, Federer versus Nadal are in a tennis match. They, they go, well, we think it's this, but they inbuilt margin into, that, uh, into those odds that if you're consistently betting off 100 tennis matches or 100 sporting events or 100 race events, that you've got margin against you. So if you're a punter having a bet and you have one bet a year, well, you might be right on your Manchester United bet or your Lakers bet. You might actually get that correct and the bookies have priced it wrong and you may win. But if you're having on average uh, 60 bets or whatever many bets a week, you're consistently betting with 4%, 6%, in horse racing 10 or 12% against you. And that house edge makes it very difficult for uh, a better to beat the bookies. Um, but there's a few super groups that have built uh, statistical models and found a significant edge to bet into this $3 trillion market. And so you see some of the leading groups around the world. Obviously, you, you see the likes of Tony Bloom, who just got an MBE off, off the King in England. Uh, he owns Brighton Football Club. He runs the largest soccer syndicate in the world. Uh, you see, obviously, David Walsh and Jelko. David Walsh owns MoMA Museum. Uh, they have the largest horse racing syndicate in the world. The people that are able to build uh, these models and work out the true probability or what they believe is the true probability of, of these events happening are able to beat the bookies and beat uh, the market betting into the paramutual pools and the exchanges. They're very rare. There's only probably... Uh, 10 to 15 of these super groups around the world. But we were um, able to invest and option up a leading tennis syndicate, a, a young guy by the name of uh, Tom Dry. And he was ex-Tony Bloom and has built a, uh, a, a tennis syndicate betting all around the world on, on tennis events, significantly able to scale his, his business up, triple turnover the last three years running. And that's the third pillar of our uh, strategy. That's a, a dividend. We have a profit share. Uh, we're able to execute an option deal in his business and have a profit share of 10% of what that syndicate uh, wins. And so that's basically the three pillars. And I'll expand on that third one also later on if there's questions, because we see that we have, uh, there's an opportunity to expand further into professional betting. And we see that as a dividend play uh, for our investors. So there's basically three pillars is, the first, uh, we focus on suppliers and specifically around finding suppliers where we think have got huge upside and trying to invest in them and buy options in those suppliers. The second pillar is we park our money in the 13F strategy, uh, following the best performing funds in the world and leave the money parked there until we need to utilize that money to go into executing an option deal. And the third pillar is that we have a 10% profit share 
in a leading tennis syndicate, Global Tennis Syndicate. That's a, a profit share agreement. We have a dividend that gets distributed to our unit holders uh, every year. Uh, and we think that that can expand further, both from Tom Dry's perspective in the tennis syndicate, but more broadly from a professional betting angle, we think there's the ability to buy an option up further um, betting syndicates. Right. Okay. And so just to summarize for those watching, you invest in both um, public and private businesses, both domestically Correct. and internationally? Correct. So all our focus and our our significant outperformance comes from where we have expertise. So we're very narrow in that we focus on one industry being the gambling wagering industry. And then within that industry, we focus very narrowly in the specific suppliers to the businesses that we really understand. And to put it in context, it's very narrow what, what we do, but it's actually quite broad in that the big operators like Tabcorp and Sportsbet and FanDuel and Caesars and MGM, they have they differentiate on marketing and customer experience, which is really product. And so any one of these organizations might have 500 plus products in their roadmap waiting to deploy to try and differentiate what the user experience is for the customer. So there's such a vast array of different businesses that we're seeing all the time that we're analyzing and assessing whether we invest in them or not. So that's where we spend all our time. We park our money in this uh, strategy. We have two analysts focusing once a quarter on what these 13F positions are. And that's really just a, a proxy for cash or putting it into the S&P. We think we'll uh, outperform the S&P over the long term with that strategy, but we constantly evaluate and assess whether we continue to do so. And then the third pillar is a dividend uh, play. We're already invested in that business. We want to be long-term holders in, in that business. And we see that's an area that we focus to try and expand through our strategy, op, op, our pillar one. Can we get further option deals and investments in betting syndicates? And, and we spend quite a lot of time on that. I, I don't know, Kellen, if, if there's questions or if you'd like me to go into how we actually analyze the tech of where we make an investment. And I might give a couple of examples if that suits, or there may be questions that you want me to um, to answer. No, I'd love to find out how you conduct due diligence specifically on the companies and how long does that take approximately? Yeah, yeah so look, uh, my my area of expertise is, is not in understanding code or from a technical background. So I, I've tried to do coding course for 10, 10 weeks plus and, and I can't tell the difference whether something's been coded really well or the technology is great. I understand what operators need mm -hmm. and I can understand if a piece of tech is a good fit for those operators. But really uh, our uh, real edge comes from our um, our team of developers that, that basically go and assess, has this been built well? So I'll give you two examples. Um, the first is we invested and optioned up uh, a, a platform business, a business that so when I could describe a platform, it's it's the website and engine that takes the bets and displays all the odds and the CRM and and the onboarding of the customer when they go to a website like a sports bet or Ladbrokes and so on. So we see these type of businesses all the time and they all look quite nice, like the same user interface and, and it looks fine, but I can't tell technically whether that website's worth 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, 100 million. Yeah. Our, um, our core engineer, our key engineers basically assessed and said, look, this business is uh, built really well. The code's fantastic. It has the ability to scale for us to uh, basically, for us to be able to build that would take us two years using Australian developers, probably $12 million of development time. We were able to invest in that business with an option at a $1 million valuation. And that, uh, and then sell it uh, one million US dollar valuation, and then sell it within seven months for our union holders at a twenty three million dollar um, valuation, a US value, US dollar valuation. Now that assessment wasn't mine. I, I I don't know whether it's built or not. That really our engineers and the ability to say, well, look, this is a, a scalable piece of tech built really well. And then when they've been able to do it, when we then go and say, well, look, we want to sell it in seven seven months time. The people doing DD go, actually, this is really great piece of tech. It saves us multiple years of trying to build it. And, and that's really um, our edge of having these key people that are built 
leading apps websites for the last 15 plus years in the industry. Um, the other thing um, that I, I thought I'd mention, I talk about uh, Caitlin how in uh, we did some due diligence on um, an esports data provider. So there's many esports data providers and we've identified what we thought was the leading one um, based in Prague. We went and spent time with the team there. We looked at their models. We looked at how they were assessing the data, how they were coming up with the, their odds for the different esports events. They then said they had unique agreements with the esports providers. We called uh, the groups at League of Legends, Riot Games and said, look, have they got agreements in place? We then spoke to the bookmakers they supplied the odds to, what's their uptime, what's their service level agreements, do they keep to them, are there key man dependencies? We spent multiple uh, phone calls, hours on the phone speaking to their suppliers, who they speak to, looking at their business, looking under the hood, uh, going to, to their site. Um, and this basically allows us to then assess. And then we speak to all of their, uh, their competitors in the space. So who are all the other esports providers? Who do they see as, uh, as a threat to their business going forward? Who does it uniquely? And then after we've spoken to them all, spoken to all of the bookmakers that actually take the uh, esports data, speaking to the esports leagues, then go and visit them on site in Prague, analyze, have they got something unique? Then we move forward and, and go, okay, is it uh, an opportunity for us to invest? Are we getting decent valuation and, and so on? And, and that's sort of the rigor that we go into of trying to understand, is this tech unique? Is it scalable? and doesn't have the ability to go from having one or two contracts uh, to having 20 plus contracts. Okay. And we have a question submitted from Brad here and he's asked, hi, Tom, how do you see the intersection of crypto and gambling play out? Look, so I'm not a crypto expert at, at all. What I've seen, which is amazing, is the growth of the crypto operators. So um, uh, the largest operators in, in in the world now are crypto operators and they are leading the way in terms of customer engagement. You see uh, the use of um, the stake with, with Drake, uh, with how they've got their own own like channel where you can watch all like different esports and different stuff. So they're really, uh, their sponsorships of the F1, they're doing stuff that's truly unique and the customer experience is fantastic. And obviously when you bet in crypto, you the, the customers are able to onboard seamlessly and they're also able to get um, payments very very quickly and and then you see uh, groups like sportsbet.io and their vip engagement i think is is some of the best i've seen in the world the way that they uh, look after their vips what they've done in Tallinn in estonia uh, they're building like new hotels casino sites they've got um, luxury yachts boats for their teams they do huge on-site for all their key suppliers and, and customers uh, where they take them to Talon for, for like four or five days. That They're really um, disrupting. And I, and I see this as a unique time in that in early 2000s, you saw the existing large operators like the Ladbrokes and the William Hills and the Corals getting disrupted through the internet by the likes of Bet365. And I see this as another uh, dramatic change in that, Crypto is allowed and the ability to accept payments from a global perspective is allowed another leap change in what competition looks like in the betting space. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, while I'm not a crypto expert, I, I definitely see from a user experience and uh, and as an industry, they're really uh, changing the game of what uh, a new standard of competition is and, and, and doing a great job of it. Uh, I should add, we, we don't invest in any operators. We only invest in uh, in the suppliers, um, but obviously keep a close eye on on what all the key operators around the world are doing. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Brad, for that question. Um, and so what's been the fund performance since you launched five years ago? Uh, look, we've, um, we've, I think it's 27 or 28 times our investors' money um, in, in performance uh, over the, coming on to five years. Uh, over 100% per annum compound over that period of time. Uh, last year, we performance was 39.5% um, performance. Um, the uh, As the fund uh, grows, um, obviously, the uh, we need more sizable um, 
uh, option deals and, and deals to come off to have that really outsized performance. But we think with those three pillars that we have the ability to maintain, um, or we're very hopeful, uh, obviously, that the families over 50% of the fund, we, we see this as a key, uh, or it's definitely my key focus, hopefully, over the next 20 years. We see that we our, our edge is that we're just going to focus on the one area we know. Uh, mm. We're hopefully going to perform in line, if not better than the market with our 13F strategy. That's definitely our, our hope. And and then we hope that this tennis syndicate and other syndicates that we invest in can significantly grow and scale. And if we can do those things, then um, hopefully our performance will will continue to be good like it has been over the last um, five years. And do you disclose all to the investors or the um, suppliers that you invest in? Correct. Yeah, so we do. So we um, basically, uh, our investors uh, come to us often and say, well, what do you think about this business? We do due diligence on what, obviously way more businesses that we than we invest in. We're very narrow uh, in the businesses that we actually do invest in and, and buy options in. Um, but we obviously look at so many businesses in the space. So our investors like to get an idea of what our thoughts are on these on these businesses. And then they uh, obviously see the businesses that we invest in and, and we keep them updated real time of we've done this deal. We think this is interesting because of this. Mm, okay. And um, what area of gaming and wagering are you most excited about as we enter 2024? Look, I think the um, the areas of business that are going growing really rapidly, obviously, um, to Brad's question, crypto, the crypto operators are just growing uh, at a phenomenal rate. Um, the key betting syndicates, they have a real edge in something different and they are obviously making huge amounts of money. And then I think the interesting thing from um, other businesses, and these businesses have been re-rated and, and look uh, real value in, in a sense, or some of them do, in that these affiliate businesses, because the cost per acquisition in the US market, and, and I'm sure in Brazil now that it's opening up, is significant. So if you have a unique way of attracting large uh, customer base through non-traditional channels being like Google and Facebook, if you can actually attract customers um, and get a low cost per acquisition, well, then that's very attractive. And, and I think uh, is compelling, especially for these operators trying to get new customers in in these new regulated markets. Mm, okay. Well, with that being said, I think we'll wrap it up here. But for those that are interested in finding out more or investing, how should they get in contact? Oh, yeah. So look, we're only for wholesale in, wholesale investors, um, and obviously have a large high minimum um, check size. But if if you're interested in just getting updates on the industry and what we're doing, uh, just go to waterhousevc.com. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for your time and joining me today. And thank, thank you very much. Joined the live webinar. Thanks so much, Kevin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.